Europe. For hundreds of years, it was the bloodiest continent on Earth, but no longer. Following the Second World War, the United States wanted to unite Western Europe against the alleged threat of communism. To achieve this aim, the United States helped reconstruct Western Europe and invested in the creation of a regional security community. A security community is a region where war has become unthinkable, where states have learned to trust, rather than fear, their people and their neighbors. Members of a security community have similar goals and values and share a common identity. The concept of a security community was first developed by Carl W. Deutsch, a German immigre and political scientist. In his scholarship, Deutsch viewed nationalism as a pathology that could be used as a weapon of mass mobilization and mass destruction. Wanting to cure Europe of its militaristic nationalism, Deutsch suggested that the United States invest in the creation of a Western European security community. He proposed the implementation of a rules-based regime founded on the principles of collective security and regional integration. These principles would teach states that their own national security, economic interest, and legitimacy depends on the security of their neighbors. The spillover effects of having fostered regional integration, Deutsch contended, would give rise to a regional identity. The United States eventually adopted Deutsch's plan, and in many ways, it was successful. No longer are major European states warring with one another. They have become more institutionally and ideologically integrated. Within the region, they no longer need to resort to coercive balancing or regime change. When problems arise between European states, they are resolved politically rather than through war. In this respect, the United States played a positive role in Europe, helping to bring security to the continent. Of course, the European security community should not be overly idealized. Initially, it was a Cold War weapon. Today, it remains a key part of Washington's imperial project, and European states themselves engage in or benefit from neocolonialism. There are also signs that the European security community is beginning to unravel. But nevertheless, the European continent remains relatively peaceful and secure. Compare it to the greater Middle East. The Middle East, unlike Europe, is insecure. The region is fragmented. There is no shared sense of political belonging or regional identity like there is in Europe. In the Middle East, people have been divided along national, tribal, ethnic, and sectarian lines. Violence is pervasive. Because they are unstable, governments rule through coercion rather than consensus. States depend on a small, loyal social base to survive. Threatened by their neighbors and other external powers, countries are always preparing for war. Why is the greater Middle East insecure? There have been many attempts to answer this question. Here are some of the most common. First, there is the widely held belief that Middle Easterners in general, and Muslims and Arabs in particular, have a set of essential negative traits. It is said that they are violent, irrational, and full of unjustifiable rage and animus, especially towards the West. I think Islam hates us. Why do they hate us? They hate us because of their religion. 
They hate us because of their culture and they hate us because of peer pressure. They threaten us and they are threatening. They bring that desert stuff to our world. This is a result of hundreds of years of racist, orientalist studies and commentary on the Middle East. And during times of war, when the enemy making was in full force, essentialized racist statements were made about certain Europeans prior to the formation of the Western European security community. The symbols and the leaders change, but Germany's maniacal urge to impose its will on others continues from generation to generation. You are up against German history. It isn't good. This book was written chapter by chapter, not by one man, not by one Führer. It was written by the German people. The German people are not our friends. You will not associate with German men, women, or children. Others say that conflicts over natural resources, such as oil, are the main reason for insecurity in the Middle East. But control over natural resources only becomes a security issue once states believe it is necessary for their survival. And this thinking is a byproduct of imperialism. Throughout the last century, oil has become a strategic commodity. Without it, states would not be able to build and maintain modern militaries. Some argue that insecurity in the Middle East is the result of a competition for regional supremacy, fueled by sectarian differences. This argument is used to explain the current rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia. You've been rivals for centuries. Such misinformed statements are frequently made by members of Washington's political class. The Middle East is going through a transformation that will play out for a generation rooted in conflicts that date back millennia. Tragic turmoil in the Middle East runs back to the dawn of history. Those who make these statements ignore the fact that prior to 1932, Saudi Arabia was not even a country. And under the reign of the Shah, Iran maintained a very close relationship with Saudi Arabia. In fact, until the Iranian Revolution in 1979, the two nations teamed up with the United States and the United Kingdom to combat Arab nationalism and left-wing movements throughout the region. In the desert kingdom of Oman, a British officer leads a company of Omani troops into action against communist guerrillas. Iran, because of the great leadership of the Shah, is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. The Shah had done our bidding and carried our load in the Middle East uh, for quite some time. The sectarian split between majority Sunni Saudi Arabia and majority Shia Iran did not become a violent issue until such differences were politicized and made to be a security threat. Besides, as has already been mentioned, prior to 1946, Europe was the bloodiest continent on Earth. Tens of millions died in the First and Second World Wars alone. But this did not preclude the formation of a security community on the continent. So, why is the greater Middle East insecure? The answer lies with U.S. foreign policy. Rather than work to build a regional security community, like in Europe, in the Middle East, the United States has instituted a regime of insecurity. After World War II, the United States could not even imagine the possibility of a Middle Eastern security community. Instead of supporting regional integration, Washington divided the Middle East into friends and foes. To maintain its control over the region, the United States balances the power of state and non-state actors. 
Because this balancing takes place in multiple spaces, with multiple players, it is best described as multi-balancing. The most severe manifestation of multi-balancing is regime change, when a government is overthrown by force. Regime change is used to threaten states and force them into compliance. If the U.S. thinks a state has stepped out of line, that state will likely fall prey to a regime change effort. U.S. multibalancing has divided the Middle East into roughly three interconnected spaces of conflict. In the Near East, the United States works to ensure the military supremacy of Israel over all other regional actors. In the Persian Gulf, the United States empowers the monarchies of the Arabian Peninsula to challenge Iran. And in South Asia, the United States uses Pakistan as a tool for balancing multiple contradictory interests. Together, these spaces of conflict form the insecurity communities of the Middle East. While the United States leads this regime of insecurity, it cannot control its outcomes. In the insecurity communities of the Middle East, unintended consequences are all too common, leading to further insecurity. Now that the U.S.-led regime of insecurity has been established, every state and non-state actor in the region must follow its logic. It's best to think of this regime of insecurity like a violent game with implicit rules that every state in the region must follow to survive. First, states must decide whether to resist U.S. imperialism or go along with it. Siding with U.S. imperialism has material benefits for the ruling class, but entails sacrificing national sovereignty. Opposing it leads to a U.S. pressure campaign or regime change effort. Second, states must balance against their regional rivals. For example, Iran being surrounded by hostile states and U.S. military bases must take steps to defend itself. Third, states must balance their own populations they must decide how much repression is necessary to survive. This is especially true for governments being targeted by the United States, as they are more susceptible to coups and other forms of outside interference. If a state is too harsh, it risks being overthrown by its own population. Fourth, states must decide how to relate to non-state actors such as Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, the so-called Islamic State, and many others. For example, Iran is allied with Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, Hamas and Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip, and various militias in Iraq. On the other hand, many of the monarchies of the Arabian Peninsula such as Saudi Arabia and Qatar, have supported ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and other such terrorist groups. Because states are always fighting for survival, the U.S.-led regime of insecurity in the Middle East is inherently violent. Just as balancing is unavoidable, so too is violence. As stated before, the insecurity communities of the Middle East are products of U.S. foreign policy. Those who design and implement U.S. foreign policy are collectively known as the American Foreign Policy Establishment. The American Foreign Policy Establishment is made up of three social groups and institutions. The government, think tanks, and mainstream academia. The government is the easiest to understand. 
These are the people who put U.S. foreign policy into action, including cabinet officials, intelligence agencies, the president, and Congress members and their staff. The second part of the American foreign policy establishment is think tanks. In short, think tanks are advocacy groups whose top goal is to influence policymaking. The, the holy grail, if you want, is, is actually being able to influence a policy decision, right? I mean, shaping the way that some decision was made, perhaps in, in Congress and government. But, but in reality, much of the time what we're trying to do is really shape public ideas, right? The way people talk about things, the way people frame issues. And if you can do that, ultimately you may influence policy. Think tanks mold public opinion by writing reports, producing multimedia content, and perhaps most importantly, influencing the media. Think tanks also directly influence policymakers. In fact, nearly all major policies and priorities in Washington, D.C. come from think tanks. It is not only policy proposal that come from think tanks, but government employees as well. The American Enterprise Institute, some of the finest minds in our nation are at work in some of the greatest challenges to our nation. You do such good work that my administration has borrowed 20 such minds. I can't overstate the debt of this administration to you at AEI. You did so much of the intellectual groundwork for our policies. And to help put those policies in place, you've given us over two dozen outstanding men and women to work in this administration. Indeed, there is a revolving door between think tanks and government. Members of think tanks go into government just as often as government employees go into think tanks. The third part of the American foreign policy establishment is mainstream academia. Mainstream academia consists of individuals operating at top-ranking universities. Prestigious universities, especially in the field of international relations, have close ties to both think tanks and government. We're incredibly close to all the top think tanks. To be able to see it in person and experience it is very cool. Hello, I'm Doug Elmendorf, the new dean of Harvard Kennedy School. I came back to Harvard after 20 years working for the U.S. government. To see how the American foreign policy establishment functions, let's analyze a small section of it. The Kagans and the connections they have within the American foreign policy establishment show how the entire system operates. The people driving American foreign policy comprise a small, well-connected, and mostly bipartisan community. Uh, take a little break. Uh, Robert Kagan is our guest, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and uh, also uh, writes a monthly uh, column uh, for the Washington Post. Mr. Kagan serves on the Foreign Policy Advisory Board of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, but more notably in this election season is a foreign policy advisor to the presidential campaign of Mitt Romney. Another thing has happened since the last time we were together, I think you were with Carnegie then, now you're with Brookings. What's that, how did you make that shift and why? Well, I had, I had a wonderful time at Carnegie. I was there for 13 years. Uh, I, uh, I, I worked there under Jessica Matthews as the president and, and she was terrific. Um, uh, the president of Brookings, uh, Strobe Talbot, I've known for many years. My wife worked for him for several years at the State Department during the Clinton administration. And, and um, I know I have a lot of friends there. And at, at some point, it just seemed right to, to make the switch. But there is They're a... right next door to each other, by the way. So it's not a big geographical leap. Bring the audience up to date on you and your background. Now, Donald Kagan and Fred Kagan are who? How do they relate to you? Donald Kagan's my father. Bob and Fred are my two sons. Uh, Bob is the older, and he is a, a very interesting fellow who uh, um, went to Yale, and then he went to the uh, uh, Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, and then he went into the government, and he put in a, a batch of years working mostly in the State Department. And as a political job? A political job, yes. For which president? Uh, for President Reagan. Now, about this time, I feel really bad that I haven't introduced our audience to your brother. I mean, he's been left out so far. So here is <laughs> Fred Kagan. 
I'm Frederick Kagan. I'm the director of the Critical Threats Project at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, and we are partnered with the Institute for the Study of War, uh, both national security think tanks in Washington, D.C. You're probably best known if you ask someone on the street in Washington, Fred Kagan, architect of the Iraq surge. We have a public policy dynasty that uh, we've seen over the years, and we're going to fill in another blank. At our table is Fred Kagan, Dr. Frederick Kagan of the American Enterprise Institute. When I say uh, Kagan dynasty, what's that involve? Uh, well, my father is uh, Donald Kagan, uh, Yale classicist. Uh, my brother is Bob Kagan. And there's, a, there's another Kagan coming behind me, my wife, Kim Kagan. Kim Kagan, how would you describe what you do for a living? I'm a military analyst and a military historian. I am the president of the Institute for the Study of War. We are partnered with the Institute for the Study of War. My wife, Kim Kagan. Uh, and I did, uh, in November and December 2006, participate in a study at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, known as the Iraq Planning Group, which uh, did recommend a surge of five brigades into Iraq. <laughs> I, I think in reading this book, however, uh, if I was a casual observer reading the book for the first time, I would still have no idea the extent to which you yourself were involved in the search. Uh, you detach yourself well within the book, probably because you're a very humble person. Oh! You're a historian who taught at West Point, Yale, Georgetown, American University, all over the place. Where did you go to college? I went to Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, and I've spent uh, some large portion of the past 15 years in and out of Yale. I went to Yale, and Fred went to Yale, and Fred's wife went to Yale. And what about your wife? She went to Brown. She's just, you know, she, she's just different. So your father is at Yale teaching, right. and your brother is over in Belgium. Right. What's he doing there? Uh, he's working on uh, public policies, uh, still with the Carnegie uh, Institute and uh, also with the German Marshall Fund. And who is his wife? Uh, Victoria Newland is the U.S. ambassador to NATO. <clears throat> You're married to Victoria Newland. The last time she was here, she was the ambassador to NATO under the Bush administration. Victoria Newland, U.S. ambassador to NATO. Where did you meet Bob Kagan? I met Bob Kagan in George Shultz's State Department. He was uh, uh, George Shultz's speechwriter, and I was a freshly minted baby diplomat. And you worked for Vice President Cheney as uh, his advisor on the National Security Council, or on security issues? I was his deputy national security advisor. Now, how does that work when you're nonpartisan? Well, I've also worked for senior Democrats. When I saw her, when I first got to sort of have a sense of her, she was handling the podium here the spokesperson for the department. Listen, before we leave uh, Syria, I just want to take the opportunity, if you didn't see it, uh, to draw your attention to the Human, right, uh, Human Rights Watch report that was released today. I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to read the report. Um, and, you know, in many cases, the Human Rights Watch asserts that even children have been subject to torture by you, the Assad you, regime. Do you see the, that report as credible and with, with and, and, and solid, and you're putting your endorsement. And you're we have no reason to believe that it is not credible. It's based on eyewitness accounts, and they're reporting from a broad cross section of human rights figures inside Syria. So the next time Human Rights Watch comes out with a report that's critical of Israel for its treatment of the Palestinians, I'll assume that you're going to be saying the same thing, correct? That you think that the report is credible, it's based on eyewitness accounts, uh, as and you're not going to say that it's politically motivated and. and, and, and and should, should be dismissed? 
You know, Matt, as, as you have made clear again and again in this room, we are not always consistent. And that's why President Obama and I know with absolute confidence that there is no one more qualified to lead this bureau than Toria. I, did the Kagans agree on most things? <laughs> we agree on most things, yes. What's your position on the Iraq war in the first place? Should we have done what we did? I think uh, that we should have done what we did in 2003. Should we be in Iraq? I do think so. I do think so. Certainly at this point, I think there's no option. Should we have gone in in the first place? I do think so. Uh, I don't have any reason to think that that was a mistake getting rid of Saddam Hussein. Union, New Jersey, Independent, you're on the air. Good morning, gentlemen. Hi. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Kagan, I, I'm really shocked and confused that you neocons over at the American Enterprise Institute, I'm, I'm just shocked that you're still sitting here trying to create the illusion that Iraq is this beautiful place and everything's peachy. You told us that this place was going to be an easy cakewalk. Caller, could I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah. When, when you use the term neocon, what does that mean? Oh, uh, come on, Peter, you know it. It means that we're talking politics now. Let's stop acting stupid. And you've been known as a neoconservative. Is that a fair label? I'm not thrilled with the label because I don't know what it means anymore. Would you be a, ne a neocon? People use that term, and I don't really know what that means. Does your husband? No, no. I'm not a neocon. I've never said that I was. Well, it's the, it's the project for the new American century. Yeah. You and Bill Crystal founded that project. Right. What year? I think it was roughly 1996. The project for the new American century was a neoconservative think tank funded by Robert Kagan and Bill Crystal in 1997. Members of the project for the new American century and signatories to its letters included militaristic hawks such as Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and Paul Wolfowitz, who had served in prior Republican administrations. The influence the project for the new American century ultimately had in Washington, D.C. is debatable. But what is not debatable is the influence its members went on to have in the George W. Bush administration as most of them were given high-ranking national security and defense positions. As they re-entered government, they carried with them the ideas laid out in many of the Project for the New American Century's documents. The most controversial document published by the Project for the New American Century is a September 2000 report titled, Rebuilding America's Defenses in which it's argued that the U.S. military must establish four core missions. One of these missions is to fight and decisively win multiple simultaneous major theater wars. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just... He said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. Many of those associated with the project for the new American century are still working within the United States government. This includes Elliot Abrams. Abrams was the key man in Reagan administration policy toward Central America when uh, that administration was abetting uh, what a court recently ruled was a genocide in Guatemala, when the U.S. was backing uh, the army of El Salvador in a series of death squad assassinations uh, and, and massacres, and when the U.S. was invading uh, Nicaragua with a Contra force uh, that went after what uh, one U.S. general described as uh, soft uh, targets, uh, meaning civilians, things like cooperatives. Are you practicing law these days? I'm not. I am running a think tank called the Ethics and Public Policy Center here in Washington. Elliot Abrams is coming aboard to lead our efforts on Venezuela. His critical work will get started right away. John Bolton. The declared policy of the United States of America should be the overthrow of the Mullah's regime in Tehran. 
And that's why before 2019, we here will celebrate in Tehran. Thank you very much. So you've, you've called for regime change in Iraq, Libya, Iran, and Syria. In the first two countries, we've had regime change, and obviously it's been, I'd say a disaster, I think no, we agree. No, I, I don't agree with that, and, and let, me, let me... You don't think it's been a disaster? No. The overthrow of Saddam Hussein, that military action was a resounding success. You wrote a piece for the New York Times saying we ought to bomb Iran. If we had done that then, where do you think we'd be now? Well, I think Israel could have done it 15 years before, and we'd be in a much better place. And Zolmei Khalilzad. There's tremendous connections with people who've been in the United States government. I knew uh, uh, Ashraf Ghani uh, uh, from the days that we were both in school together. Uh, He's president of Afghanistan right now. Exactly. He uh, and I came to America together in 1966. Some of your background so that people can know the different jobs that you've had. And you can see there, the, we go back to 1985, well, I'll ask you about before then, where you were special advisor to the Undersecretary of State Political Affairs. I have no doubt that uh, and the U.S. promises of support and uh, commitment to the Afghan cause will be honored in the future as it has been in the past. 03 to 05, ambassador to Afghanistan, 05 to 07, U.S. ambassador to Iraq, 07, 09, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. What are you doing these days? Well, I am uh, running a small uh, uh, advisory, business advisory organization called Griffin Capital. I'm also a counselor at CSIS, Center for Strategic and International Studies. I serve on the board of several nonprofits, such as the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, the Atlantic Council. Two universities that I'm very proud of that I'm on the board of. He was appointed special representative for Afghanistan reconciliation by Secretary of State Pompeo uh, in September 2018. I will ask your forgiveness for my voice uh, today. Uh, this is what 42 hours of talking with the Taliban can do to you. Other notable members of the project for the new American century include Donald Rumsfeld, then during your tenure, do you expect to see a regime change in Iraq? Oh, I would certainly hope so. I would, uh, I would think most of the re people in the region and the world recognize that, that uh, the world would be a better place without uh, that regime. That regime threatens its neighbors uh, repeatedly. It, it uh, engages, it's listed on the terrorist list for the world uh, that everyone knows. They're not a model of good behavior. Well, let me take you back uh, about 20 years uh, ago. Uh, the date, I believe, was uh, in De December 20th, 1983. Uh, you were meeting with uh, Saddam Hussein. I think we have some video of that um, of, of that meeting. Tell me what was going on during this, uh, this Where meeting. Where did you get this video? From the Iraqi television? This was from Iraqi television. When did they give it to you? Recently well, or back then? We have dug this out of the CNN library. I see. Isn't so, that interesting? There I am. Richard Pearl. We have to be rid of Saddam Hussein once and for all. Uh, that regime must go. Did the U.S. go into Iraq at the right time? Should have gone in sooner. What do you think about torture in wartime? Well, it's not something that we do. So every day that goes by now, uh, appears to be an occupation that is not for the benefit of the people of uh, Iraq, although uh, it, it surely is. The United States in this century has been uh, the single greatest source uh, of benefit for the, the rest of the world that history has ever seen. And Paul Wolfowitz. Paul Wolfowitz ran the World Bank from 2005 to 2007, served as Deputy Secretary of Defense in the Bush administration. Dominic on our independence line, go ahead. I got a lot of kids around here that were killed in Iraq, and, uh, and they're really good kids. I mean, they're going to be fine young men when they grew up. They were the best in Montana. And I'm a three-tour Vietnam veteran, and I want to let you know, sir, there's people out here like me that know what you did. You made up a lie to start that war. We're broke as hell. We can't even fix the oil mess. The oil companies can't fix it. Our country's going down to twos because of you. How come they haven't fired you and put you and the rest of those guys in jail and all taken right. all your money? All right, Dominic, you, you've made your point. Care to respond? Look, 
Wars are terrible. We got into this war because we were attacked. What did Iraq have to do with what? The attack on the World Trade Center. Nothing. Let me be clear about one thing. There were no lies. The British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. Simply stated, there is no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. The Iraqi regime possesses biological and chemical weapons. There is no doubt that he is amassing them to use them against our friends, against our allies, and against us. Baghdad has failed to disarm its weapons of mass destruction, willfully attempting to evade and deceive the international community. We will in fact find uh, uh, weapons or, or evidence of uh, weapons programs. Today, no nation can possibly claim that Iraq has disarmed. I think what will happen is we'll discover people who will tell us where to go find it. We know where they are. They're in the area around uh, Tikrit and Baghdad. The, our people are going to find out the truth, and the truth will say that this intelligence is good intelligence, no doubt in my mind. It turns out that we have not found weapons of mass destruction. The main reason we went into Iraq at the time was we thought he had weapons of mass destruction. It turns out he didn't. There are a lot of people who lie and get away with it. One of the co-founders of the project for the New American Century is Bill Crystal, who is now frequently seen on cable news shows. Our guest is Bill Crystal, editor of the Weekly Standard. Look, we would, I would be shocked if we don't find weapons of mass destruction, and I think that is one of the main rationales for the war. And if I expect us to find them, and I think if we don't find them, that is that that would undercut in part the rationale for the war. That would be a great blow if, if, if Saddam has not been developing weapons of mass destruction. But I would agree that if after the war we aren't treated more or less as liber a liberating force, if people don't uh, aren't happy that they have had Saddam's tyranny removed, and that would also be a, a rebuke to the Bush administration, to those of us who, who counseled that this war was just and necessary. I mean, this was a, you know, I, I, I accept the possibility that I'm wrong. I we was led into the Iraq war with the fact that there were weapons of mass destruction, there were nuclear weapons there, there was all kind of weapons there, which proved to be false, absolutely false. And your magazine, Fox Network, and AEI, all of y'all hyped that to a degree that was just unimaginable. Even the President Bush admitted that there was no weapons of mass destruction there. In lieu of that fact, being the fact that there's 4,500 American lives lost there, will you personally apologize to those folks right now? Simple yes or no. Thank you. No, I think the war is right, and I think we've succeeded in the war. I'm not apologizing for something uh, that I didn't, that I think was not wrong. I think going to war to remove Saddam was the right thing to do, a necessary and just thing to do. The American foreign policy establishment never directly admits to its mistakes or wrongdoings. I don't think you can make a case that the world would be better off today if Saddam Hussein were still in power. So no regrets about Iran. I think we made exactly the right decisions. If lessons are learned from any particular crime or blunder, they are invariably the wrong ones. We also have a history of kind of moving in and out of Pakistan. I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. And we did it because we were locked in this struggle with the Soviet Union. They invaded Afghanistan, and we did not want to see them control Central Asia. And we went to work. U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. He wanted to arm the Mujahideen without revealing America's role. On the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass, he urged the soldiers of God to redouble their efforts. We know of their deep belief in God, the and way, we are confident that their struggle will succeed. That land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. And it was President Reagan in partnership with the Congress uh, led by Democrats 
who said, you know what, sounds like a pretty good idea. Let's deal with the ISI and the Pakistani military and let's go recruit these Mujahideen and let's great, let's get some to come from Saudi Arabia and other places importing their Wahhabi brand of Islam so that we can go beat the Soviet Union. And we, guess what? They retreated, they lost billions of dollars and it led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So there's a, a very strong argument which is it wasn't a bad investment to end the Soviet Union but let's be careful what we sow because we will harvest. So we then left Pakistan. We said, okay, fine, you deal with the stingers that we've left all over your country. You deal with the mines that are along the border. And by the way, we don't want to have anything to do with you. In fact, we're sanctioning you. So we stopped dealing with the Pakistani military and with ISI, and we now are making up for a lot of lost time. So according to Hillary Clinton and most of the American foreign policy establishment, the problem is not that the United States and its allies waged jihad against the Soviet Union, arming, training, and equipping fanatical terrorists and spawning groups like Al-Qaeda, but that Washington left the region in the 1990s. Those within the American foreign policy establishment are not unable to learn because they are stupid, but because of the imperial logic that governs their thinking. In response to the question whether America was born great, achieved greatness, or had greatness thrust upon her, the only possible answer must be all three. Because the United States remains the world's best hope. America is still the best hope of mankind. The last best hope of Earth. They believe in a hierarchic ordering of the world, one in which the United States and so-called Western nations reign supreme. Leadership is in our DNA. There is no substitute for American leadership. The world still seeks and needs our leadership as the one indispensable nation. The United States of America will always lead and must always lead. So let me say it clearly, the United States can must and will lead in this new century. They believe they have a right and duty to intervene in the Middle East. History is not on Gaddafi's side. Assad needs to go. Gaddafi has lost the legitimacy to govern and it is time for him to go. He has Priority. lost his legitimacy and he must go. He has lost the legitimacy to rule and needs to do what is right for his country by leaving now. We have to make certain that he doesn't stick around. They believe that without their self-appointed global leadership, the world would fall apart and descend into chaos. If America doesn't lead, we leave a vacuum. And that will either cause chaos or other countries will rush in to fill the void. There will be chaos. Look, we need American leadership in international institutions to help keep the peace. But it's quite possible that if we don't lead, somebody else will. If America doesn't lead, our adversaries will. And the world will go darker, poorer, and much more dangerous. The bipartisan nature of the American foreign policy establishment cannot be emphasized enough. Well, I am very pleased to announce today the formation of a bipartisan National Security Task Force in support of my candidacy for the presidency. This task force chaired by Zbigniew Brzezinski, Henry Kissinger, and Brent Scowcroft. The members of the task force embody the best in our tradition of bipartisanship, emphasizing that when it comes to U.S. foreign policy, they are neither Republicans and Democrats, they are Americans. When it comes to foreign policy, Republicans and Democrats have strikingly similar views. Yeah, I was very flattered when Henry Kissinger said I ran the State Department better than, better than anybody had run it in a long time. With a few exceptions, members of both parties agree on the importance of maintaining and expanding U.S. hegemony. Where the two parties sometimes disagree is on how best to achieve this. There are divisions within the Israeli government, within the Iranian government, within the U.S. government. That is to say, divisions in our government, not of principle, but of uncertainty. 
And while I think we're engaged in the right course of trying to somehow or other redress the problem posed by Iran, we have to be very careful not to create a situation in which the Iranians feel they're being destroyed. My view is on the sanctions dial, from zero to 10, we're at six. And we gotta go to 10. And if you've ever seen Spinal Tap, this one should go to 11. In this example, both parties agree, Iran is a problem. The only disagreement is over how ruthless the United States should be in resolving it. Unsurprisingly, the bipartisan agreement on the need to be good stewards of the empire generates continuity. Policies are frequently maintained from one administration to the next. At the U.S. Military Academy in West Point, New York, President Obama unveiled his strategy for winning the war in Afghanistan. He spoke to an audience of cadets and a nation watching on television. The 30,000 additional troops that I'm announcing tonight will deploy in the first part of 2010. And officials often serve in both Republican and Democratic administrations. A good example of this is Robert Gates. Good evening. Tonight we celebrate the life and achievements of a dear friend and colleague, Secretary Robert M. Gates. Mr. Gates is well known to the members of this committee. He is a professional in the intelligence field with almost 25 years in government service, much of it in senior positions at the CIA and at the White House. Eight presidents, did you know them all? Were you face to face with all of them? The only one that I never met was uh, the first one, Lyndon Johnson. I want to go down and just get your reaction to the five presidents that you worked around for. Jimmy Carter. A much tougher policy in secret against the Soviet Union than the American people have ever known. He, he carried out, he began carrying out covert actions against the Soviet Union at home less than two months after he was inaugurated and began challenging the Soviets in the third world months before the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. How long were you CIA director? Uh, almost two years. Here, what years? Uh, 91, 93. What are you doing now? I am on, uh, well, I've been working on this book a fair amount. I'm on the boards of a number of uh, companies. You did academic work, speaking and all from 93 to 99. Then you were the interim dean of the George Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M in 99 for a couple years. President of Texas A&M 2002 to 2006. Defense Secretary 2006 to 2011. Earlier today, I announced my intent to nominate Robert Gates to be the next Secretary of the Defense. When Barack Obama came onto the scene, there was a great deal of hope amongst the electorate that he would bring change to Washington, D.C. I don't oppose war in all circumstances. And when I look out over this crowd today, I know there is no shortage of patriots or patriotism. What I do oppose is a dumb war. But before he was even sworn into office, he announced that he was keeping Robert Gates on as his defense secretary. I am deeply honored that the president-elect has asked me to continue as secretary of defense. Obama soon escalated military and covert operations in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, and Syria. In how many countries are we currently engaged in a shooting war? It's a good question. <laughs> you know, it's you a, have to stop and count. <laughs> stop. I'll have to stop and think about that. According to Brown University's Cost of War Project, the United States is militarily active in 80 countries across the globe. American troops are directly engaged in combat operations in 14 of them. And the Pentagon and CIA are running air and drone assassination campaigns in seven. It's no wonder then that even former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta couldn't recall these figures. I'll have to stop and think about that. But of course, Democratic Party warmongering predates Obama. President Jimmy Carter established the Carter Doctrine. There was and is, is there not, a Carter Doctrine that covers the Persian Gulf area that dates from that period? There is. In fact, uh, I was the drafter of the wording. Let our position be absolutely clear. 
an attempt by any outside force to gain control of the Persian Gulf region will be regarded as an assault on the vital interest of the United States of America And such an assault will be repelled by any means necessary, including military force. That was an official statement, a formal commitment, and I'm pleased to say that President Reagan has reiterated it, and it is a doctrine that stands in force. Bill Clinton's administration repeatedly bombed Afghanistan and Iraq, and often spoke of the need to remove Saddam Hussein. In the next century, the community of nations may see more and more of the very kind of threat Iraq poses now. A rogue state with weapons of mass destruction, ready to use them or provide them to terrorists, drug traffickers, or organized criminals. There should be no doubt Saddam's ability to produce and deliver weapons of mass destruction poses a grave threat to the peace of that region and the security of the world. There can be no peace for the Iraqi people and no genuine peace for the people of the Middle East so long as Saddam is in a position to brutalize his people and threaten his neighbors. In the interest of regional peace and for the sake of human decency, he must be removed from power. Saddam Hussein was all the things that President Bush said he was, and I said that all those things myself. I even said them for longer because I said them for eight years. U.S. foreign policy has been disastrous for the people of the greater Middle East. After more than 40 years of war, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Afghans have been killed. Millions have died from sanctions and war since the United States began meddling in Iraq in the early 1960s. Since 2011, Nearly half a million Syrians have died because of the U.S.'s covert regime change war. Palestinians have been displaced and occupied for more than 50 years. And those in the Gaza Strip continue to suffer from the Israeli siege and periodic massacres. Today, the monarchies of the Arabian Peninsula, propped up and defended by the United States, are the most tyrannical and repressive regimes in the region. And most of their cities were built and are maintained by slave labor. The Saudi-led U.S.-backed war in Yemen has created the worst humanitarian crisis on Earth. After the United States and NATO murdered Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. We came, we saw, he died. <laughs> Libya has descended into chaos and tyranny with an ongoing civil war and open-air slave markets. The list goes on. Imperialism keeps the greater Middle East insecure. Every government is fighting for survival. For example, Iran has been encircled by American military bases and U.S. allies. It is the target of vicious economic sanctions and must constantly deal with U.S. provocations. The possibilities of a disastrous and destructive war remains ever-present. Iraq is recovering from years of occupation and civil war. Its government must manage three ethno-sectarian enclaves that are exploited by the United States and other regional actors making the country nearly ungovernable. Syria has been turned into a battleground for regional and international actors. This would not have happened if the United States had refrained from trying to bring down the government in 2011. Even if all forms of external intervention, including sanctions, stopped today, it will take decades for Syria to fully recover. In Afghanistan, the United States has been participating in direct talks with the Taliban, an opportunity which the American foreign policy establishment passed up in 2001. Now, if Washington's best wishes come true, 
and the Taliban becomes a part of the Afghan central government. The U.S.'s entire effort since 2001 will have been completely futile. Next door, in nuclear-armed Pakistan, after decades of being both a U.S. friend and enemy, the state is on the brink of collapse, and its fragmented society is in dire straits. The United States has lost thousands of lives and spent trillions of dollars, and yet it is the most hated regime in the region. And the American people are not better off. Certainly, almost no one in the Middle East is better off. Nevertheless, the American foreign policy establishment continues to implement the same policies. A more peaceful Middle East is possible, but not until the U.S.-led regime of insecurity comes to an end. If Washington does not change its grand strategy and push for regional integration, the United States will be left with two choices. Voluntarily leave the Middle East or be ejected.